everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Backyard Horse Enthusiast. Today's special guest is Lauren M. Koenig, the inspiring founder and operator of HodgePodge Rescue, a dedicated 501c3 nonprofit based in upstate New York with a heart full of compassion and a mission to give animals a second chance. Lauren and her husband have built a sanctuary where every creature, whether it's a dog, cat, horse, or farm animal, receives the care, respect, and love they deserve. Through her tireless work, HodgePodge Rescue has become a safe haven, providing these animals with the medical attention, rehabilitation, and most importantly, the dignity of a loving home. Lauren's journey has transformed countless lives, reminding us all of the impact one person's dedication can have on the lives of those who cannot speak for themselves. But first, a short message from our sponsor, Shagbark Lumber and Farm in East Haddam, Connecticut. Thanks, Shagbark. special project, needed some supplies, every item on my list was right before my eyes, shopping here was easy, so quick and hassle free, now my home's a castle, glad I barked up the right tree, Shag Bark, so much to choose from Shag Bark, Shag Bark. great customer service, come to Shag Bark. Hello, Lauren, and welcome to the Backyard Horse Enthusiast. We are so pleased to have you here and so excited to hear about your journey in becoming HodgePodge Rescue. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you and, and being able to talk about the work that we do. We're so grateful. As we are grateful to you, Lauren, for doing this work. It is much needed, much, much needed. And as you have said, pre-recording, you wish you didn't have to do this work. With every ounce of my being, I, I by no means am I capable of caring for every animal in the world. So really a big part of what we do is about educating people so that they can care for their animals. And at some point in time, hopefully our work is, is no longer needed. And that would be a wonderful world to live in. Sounds like a mission. To me, <laughs> let's make it happen. We begin now. And I'm going to start by asking you some questions that are specific to the work that you're doing and to you. And I was hoping you could share with us that your journey with HodgePodge Rescue, where it began, what inspired you to transition from a childhood passion to become a full-scale rescue and sanctuary uh, it's been a very, very long journey. It's really been my entire lifetime. So I was born of very New York City, New York parents who had probably never seen a horse other than perhaps a, a New York Police Department horse at a parade or something. And my mother would tell you that a horse was my first word and it was every word thereafter. And I used to put it on the grocery list on the refrigerator and every birthday, every holiday, what, what do you want, Laura? A pony, a horse. I used to draw blueprints for how we could have a pony in the backyard of our very suburban neighborhood in New Jersey. And my poor parents were just exhausted from the horse crazy kid from birth. Um, when I was five years old, my next door neighbor was six and she was going to go to a riding camp and their minimum age was six. And somehow to this day, I don't actually know the answer, but my mom got me into that program as a five-year-old. Um, and that was it. All I ever wanted to do was be in the barn, be with horses. Um, growing up in New Jersey, the path that we had at that point in time to follow was very traditional, lead line, short stirrup, Hunter, equitation, metal clay, onto the jumpers. Um, I grew up in the most traditional English riding mentality you can possibly have. Um, I rode with some legendary trainers. 
I rode some exceptional horses and had amazing opportunities. But at some point in time along the way, I started to realize that there were some some cracks in in what I was being taught. And one of those things was I had a, a quarter horse pony. She was 14 too, that I got through 4-H because I was a 4-H kid. And she was the love of my life. We, she was a yearling. I was nine years old when we got her. She and I learned every single thing together from the ground up. I don't advise or recommend anyone do that. That is not a good idea. We just happen to be extremely lucky that she was incredible and kind. Um, and so she and I grew up together and we learned to do all kinds of things. We showed Western at one point in time, which was very funny for an equitation girl to be trying to ride Western. Um, we played, she went to college with me and we learned to play polo. Um, I was very fortunate to come upon a very infamous dressage trainer who was trained in the, in the classical French style. So I rode dressage with him. I had all these amazing experiences. I worked in a pack store growing up from the time I was 12 again. The owner thought I was older. We just didn't tell her. She paid me in cash. So I learned about tack and equipment and leather repair. And in 4-H, I learned about all kinds of topics. And I had decided when I was in the fifth grade that I was going to go to veterinary school. And I had decided because I was a very snotty young lady, still am, uh, just an old lady now. But um I was going to go to Cornell University to do my veterinary degree. And so I was laser focused. And in fact, I did go to Cornell and was an animal science major and studied nutrition and studied genetics and um, ultimately did not end up going to veterinary school, but gained an incredible amount of knowledge and continued to, to build on that. And then, um, you know, I had been nagging in the back of my brain because my trainers had really been pressuring me when I was growing up to get rid of that quarter horse mare. But we'd grown up together and she was the absolute best friend I'd ever had. And the constant pressure from these very top-notch trainers felt wrong to me. And my family didn't have the kind of money where we could have had a string of horses um, so I started catch riding other people's horses because I was indignant that I was never going to let her go. And through that experience, I started to learn about the cracks and the flaws in the equestrian foundation of the way that we view and treat these animals who give their all for us. And it started me on a path of realizing that some of the things I had done, some of the things I had learned, some of the things I had frankly taught were just wrong for our equine partners. And I wanted to do better. So in light of changing career paths, my day job is exceptionally boring and has nothing to do with animals. Um, I continued to rescue animals. And from a very young age, I was that kid who, you know, I'd find a baby bunny and I, I, I'd find a shoe box and fill it with cotton and I'd bring the baby bunny in the house. And so I was always rescuing creatures from the time I was a very little girl. Um, and then when I was an adult and I had a little tiny bit of space, I brought my horse home for the very first time. And my veterinarian was very kind. He had a string of racehorses and he gave me one of his failed racehorses to be a companion. And that was kind of where the ball started to start rolling, really. Um, we lost that horse due to a tragic accident, and then my horse was alone, and I went, nope, we can't have that. So I rescued a pony, and then just in case something bad happened, I rescued a pair of goats, because goats would be good friends, and they would eat the things the horses wouldn't. And then that just sort of started the ball rolling, and I'd never once thought about doing the rescue as a public-facing entity, as a real job. It was just, I have this little bit of space, and I can help some creatures, and that's what I'm going to do. And through very, very dear friends who also have a horse rescue, they kept sort of encouraging me and pushing me to make hodgepodge an official rescue, and so... Um, thank you to them. I finally got worn down. And so we filed for our 501c3 nonprofit paperwork in December of 2019. We couldn't have had worse timing if we tried. <laughs> we got approved in January, right before COVID. And, oh, wow. Uh, so timing has never been my strong suit uh, on those fronts. But um We've continued to expand and grow. We relocated the rescue this summer onto a much bigger property in New York State. We, we were in Texas. We relocated every single animal from Texas to New York. So 
20 animals came with us from Texas because we believe that life or longer is a commitment we make. So everybody came north and uh, we've now continued to, to grow and, and add more animals that need our help and continue to expand on what is now a 75 acre property um, that gives us a lot more opportunity to continue to grow and help more. Wow, thank you. What are you finding are some of your unique challenges in rescuing horses and other animals, especially those that are rescued from slaughter situations? So the honestly, the, the current biggest challenge that rescues like ours are facing is frankly what is being put out there on social media and trying to find the truth versus trying to allow our emotions to overtake the truth. So here in the United States, we don't slaughter horses. Uh, we closed the last three slaughter, slaughter plants in the United States in 2013. But since then, we ship horses across the borders into Mexico and Canada for the purposes of slaughter. Um, those numbers have come down in an appreciable, wonderful way, but they are still far from zero. And our goal is zero. Zero horses should go anywhere for the purposes of slaughter, particularly when we think about that these horses are being slaughtered for consumption by humans. And when you think about all of the medications and vaccinations and supplements and things that we feed our American horses, that's also a very dangerous thing for humans to be consuming. So if you don't care about horses, perhaps you care about people, and that is a big concern. But the biggest battle we're facing, frankly, is... Um, and what I'm going to call real rescue versus faux rescue. And what I mean by that is several years ago, about a decade ago, um, people started to utilize social media to spread the word about slaughter and about horses that were in need of rescue. And initially, that was a wonderful thing. And it got a lot of people to know about this problem and to know that this exists. And it started to really save vast quantities of horses. People figured out that if they cried in front of a camera with a, an attractive person in front of a very skinny or sickly horse, that very kind, warm-hearted people would throw money at them. And so they started to twist the narrative and they started to abuse and use sickly, thin, scared animals for profiteering for human purposes. And there are a number of very large scale multi-million dollar faux rescues on social media right mm. now that are crushing those of us who actually are doing the real work. And it's incredibly hard to compete with because at least here at HodgePodge, we will never invent a narrative. We will never create lies or mistrust. We will tell you the honest truth, even when we make mistakes of every single thing that happens. And the best way in our belief system that we can help horses is by preventing them from ending up in those pipelines to begin with. So unlike a lot of rescues, we take owner surrenders. They're actually our favorite type of intake because we oftentimes will get an actual history on the animal. We will know mm. something about them. Um, when you see posts on social media that say the truck is coming and urgent deadline, and those are not real. The horses that you see on social media are not going to slaughter. The ones that we don't see are already being stocked on those trucks and shipped. We won't see those horses because the fact of the matter is there are seven people in the United States who own slaughter contracts. To hold that slaughter contract, they are required by those facilitators in either Canada or Mexico to meet a certain weight amount and certain volume per week. If they don't meet that volume, they will lose their slaughter contract. So nobody wants to lose their contract. What they do is they fill those loads with animals you never have the opportunity to see or save because they're the ones that go through these auctions that are hidden in the back. We are trying very hard to prevent them from even making it to the auction to cut the head off of the snake and eliminate the pipeline altogether. But so long as people continue to throw money at the crying truck is coming lady, People like us continue to struggle to survive and do the work that we do. So that is quite frankly, our biggest challenge is, uh, for lack of a better term, fake news about slaughter horses. Wow. 
I've had my suspicions about a few very large ones that I see on social media. Yeah, and my gut has always said, mm, 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 mm. something's not right here. And so thank you for right. clarifying that. And it's not just my gut. My gut was right, was correct. And yes, we need to educate people first and foremost. You know, many of us love horses. Not all of us are equipped to have them or to or have the education in, you know, in knowing what it entails, because it's a really big commitment, really big. And uh, wow. Mm. All right. So that I don't start crying. What does a typical rehabilitation plan look like for a horse that comes into your care? Um. So that, that is an excellent, excellent question. And again, we do things probably a little bit differently than a lot of folks. Um, again, I grew up being very fortunate that I could have one horse. That was what my family could scrape by and 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 afford. So I grew up in that very traditional, I'm going to put all of my energy and everything into this one horse and she's going to have all the perfectly matching things and everything's going to have her name on it and, and all of those kinds of things. And somehow that mentality sort of stuck with me because when you have one horse, you tend to really pour it into that one horse and them specifically. So every equine or every animal, frankly, not just the equines that comes to hodgepodge gets that same approach. We treat every one of them as an individual with their individual needs. There is no one size fits all scenario um, that we have found to date. At the moment, there are 14 equines in residence here, and every one of those 14 has had a different path towards rehabilitation. And the reasoning for that is one, we have to contend with health issues frequently, and that can be anything from actual injuries that require serious medical care to anything related to their mental state. So we have one horse in residence, and he's actually a wonderful example of what we were just talking about. Um, Puck, uh, HPF's I'm Your Huckleberry, is a 17-2 hand registered Oldenburg Wormblood. He was eight years old when I rescued him for $325 from what was told to me to be the slaughter pipeline. When I saved him, it was off of social media, like a lot of very kind people do. Uh, I saw this, there's 10 horses that are set to go to slaughter today. Everyone is talking about nine of them. No one cares about this one horse. And it broke my heart. And I looked at his photo and I said, I'm going to help him. I have, I have a little bit of space. I'm going to help him. And I didn't expect him to be what he turned out to be. And what we learned when we found out who he actually was, he actually has a microchip from Germany because he was actually cured as preferent as a yearling. Um, and we were able to then track down exactly who he was because of his microchip. It then occurred to me that he could have been stolen and that there would be some person out there desperately sad looking for a horse like this because a horse like that does does not end up in the slaughter pipeline. It's all the old and sick and weak. So how is a perfectly gorgeous 17 2 hand Oldenburg warm blood in the slaughter blood? So I found a group on Facebook of amazing people who it's, it's sponsored by Purina. It's called Find Your Old Friends. And it's to connect horse people with horses that they may have lost or been looking for. And so I posted some pictures of him and his background and, and the internet was amazing. And all of these people came forth. And one of the persons who came forth asked me which slaughter we had purchased him from because she had purchased him at an auction in Georgia. This exact horse, she had photos of him. And what happened was she bought him from the auction. The auction was doing the quarantine work for her. And then when she was ready to pick him up after his quarantine period, she was told he was shipped to slaughter and couldn't be found. He was accidentally shipped. He wasn't shipped to slaughter. He wasn't accidentally shipped anywhere. He was intentionally shipped to another auction in Texas, which is where I found him. 
we later were able to piece together that he'd actually been through at least four different auctions around the country with the same kind of story and the same kind of nonsense until he ended up at the auction in Texas where I didn't leave him there. The day I bought him, I went and picked him up. And he is now a permanent resident with us because physically he is incredibly healthy. There's nothing physically wrong with him at all. He's absolutely gorgeous. He is the horse I dreamed about as a child, but mentally he has had so many slights against him that he cannot handle change at all. He gets inordinately upset. If we put a feed bin up for his brother instead of for him first by accident, he'll just refuse to eat entirely. Um, you have to, we designed our entire move around him and his needs. So physically, I can say with certainty, there's nothing wrong with him physically. Mentally, he can never leave here. He would never be able to survive another transition new people, new routines, new things would break him in ways that I'm not comfortable allowing to happen. So Huck is a permanent sanctuary resident because mentally he needs to know that this is his home and he's never going to have to worry and stress that much. Oh. So Huck's story is different than, you know, other stories because Others are not so mentally broken or others are physically broken, but mentally fine. And so we have to go through an analysis of each of them as individuals because we've never managed to succeed in finding a one size fits all solution for their physical, emotional, and mental needs. Sure. And, and each one is so individual, you know, I had a gelding once a much older gelding and every so often, out of the blue, there was a big spook and bolt. And so many would draw the conclusion that that's a behavioral. To me, it was he had been shut down because he was such a stoic kind of guy that he would bottle things up, bottle, tolerate, tolerate, tolerate until he couldn't any longer. And I share this often when I'm interviewing people and just with anyone who will listen, but I really went to the ends of the earth to provide the most comfortable setting for him. Like if anyone, a farrier, the massage therapist, anyone working on him, I would one, consult with him first. So we always knew what was going to happen that day for him. Um, no surprises. Um Everything was a choice for him to, you know, he liked to, he did not like cross ties. He, he had a few episodes where I was like, the, you feel claustrophobic and cross ties. We can't do cross. You can ground tie. Mm -hmm. So I would do everything. He had an avicular. So, you know, we did PEMF and when anyone was coming like the farrier, I would give him a pain something to relieve the pain for him I put med meditation music on and I'd be like right over the shoulder like he doesn't like that you have to lower that foot for him and when you lift this leg he's gonna jerk up real it's gonna get tight but just he'll yeah. relax back into it and I was his voice and after one particular um, time with the farrier we were all done and I, he had I had his halter and lead and I was walking him back to the paddock and I don't care who thinks I'm crazy. I know what I know. I know what I heard. And I took his halter off and he walked two strides and he stopped and he turned his head towards me. And as clear as day, I heard, thank you. And then he walked. That, yeah. that He was a man of very few words, but his heart was so huge. And he really appreciated the fact that I heard him all the time. Yeah. So mm, okay. that's exactly the, the kind of level of care we, we are trying to give. Sounds like um, it, yes. Uh, on a it's it's a challenge because when we have as many as we do, I wish that we had the funding and the backing to have massage therapists and chiropractors for everyone and add those additional um, treatments and supportive care and things, but we try very, very hard to listen to them first and foremost, because they do communicate and they do tell you what they need. You just have to be willing to listen. Absolutely. And they're very subtle as how they 
interact in a herd, it's all through subtleties. It's just the slight movement of an ear or the tail or a, a limb or whatever, a tilt of the head. Like it's, I, I would, I'm sure you would agree with this. I shouldn't put words in your head and mouth, but that we need to observe more. And one of my favorite things, pastimes is to just sit in a chair and observe how they interact, what they're saying to each other, to be aware, because they will tell you some of them are more subtle than others. But if you are available to listen and to watch and to hear, they will share with you what their needs are. The fact that you knew this gelding was, I mean, physically, that's all the stuff you can figure out, the physical stuff, if you're lucky and you've gone through all the processes. But to just understand that mentally and emotionally, he he just, he couldn't go anywhere else. It would break him. It would literally kill him. It's just so fundamentally important to the well-being of these sentient beings. And this would be a good time right now, folks, if you are interested in donating in getting a hold of Lauren at HodgePodge Rescue. I'm going to put all the contact information in the description box. And the other thing that I would like to do is I have just published my book on, and it is available on Amazon, The Happy Horse Keeper. What we're going to do is we are going to donate after publishing and shipping costs. If you purchase that paperback for $6.99, all the profits from the sale of this book using the link in the description will go to hodgepodge rescue. So let's make this happen. Let's support this very fine and very legitimate rescue, please. And now back to my questions. <laughs> Can you share with our viewers how your background in animal science and your, your hands-on experience shaped the way you approach this animal rescue and rehabilitation? Oh, absolutely. So I, I recognize that I had an extremely fortunate upbringing with horses in particular. Um, you know, riding lessons and taking riding lessons is one component of caring for them. But there's so much more as you reference in your book. So my time spent working in a tat shop for almost eight years, I learned about equipment. I learned about blankets. I learned about how to identify quality goods that will last for your animals, how to fit saddles, how to fit helmets, how equipment needs to be managed and cared for, because that's a component of the care of our animals and of ourselves as we do this work is making sure we have the appropriate and proper equipment and that we understand how to utilize it and how to care for it and make it last, particularly in rescue, we do everything we can to make things last as long as we possibly can. So that work was extremely helpful. Um, my time in 4-H, where in the 4-H horse world, it's not a situation where we raise animals and, and then auction them off. That's not how that process goes in 4-H in horse world. But you learn about public speaking. You learn about different visits. So we, I remember very distinctly a visit to a miniature horse farm. I'd never worked with miniature horses before. I learned an unbelievable amount about how different they are and what their needs are and how they need to be cared for. Um all kinds of topics that were much broader than just my very narrow English hunter equestrian lifestyle. So I got to learn about various and sundry different things like Gymkhana and Western pleasure and various things that I would otherwise never have experienced. And then, you know, in college, I was very fortunate to be an animal science major and to learn about other species of animals. I learned a lot about cows. I learned a lot about what a four chambered stomach is and how the entire digestive process functions in an animal that has as a four chambered stomach as it compares to an equine. Um, I was very lucky. I also worked for a couple of veterinarians um, in my high school years as I was preparing to become a veterinarian myself. And so I learned about surgeries. I learned about castration. I learned about how to give IV injections. And I learned about how to identify lameness and, and age horses and various things that, although I've never been a veterinarian, have been helpful in laying the groundwork from a medical perspective. And so when I see, for example, after our move, we had a, a thoroughbred who is a permanent resident, uh, one of our most uh, 
loved and adored residents, Iceman, um, who suddenly out of the blue dropped 500 pounds seemingly overnight in our care where frankly, we're, we don't do skinny here. We're very, very good at the opposite of skinny where all creatures are concerned. <laughs> so it was utterly shocking. And so my immediate thought was I need to worm him. Maybe this is a parasite load. So I wormed him. Then I called the vet and then we had blood work done. And in fact, what we've now basically been able to piece together is my, my knowledge and gut instinct of worm him immediately. Let's deal with any pests. That is likely what was causing the dramatic weight loss because we've not been able to actually identify anything else. But because I had wormed him immediately, by the time the blood work came back, it didn't show a parasite load because we'd already addressed it. So that combination of working for a veterinarian and knowing this is my go-to off-the-shelf thing combined with also recognizing I am not a veterinary professional. We rely on them for a reason. We rely on quality professionals in every way, from farriers to chiropractors to ophthalmologists to veterinary surgical centers. But do what I I, I have the knowledge and, and skill to do and then rely on the professionals to help back us up. And in combination, we end up with Iceman is now back to his normal weight and functioning as a normal horse again. So I am extremely lucky because I don't know how many people have that many different facets and components of their equine lives as they are growing up to learn all of these pieces that are central to caring for these animals full time. There's a very big difference between taking riding lessons at a barn while you're growing up where you learn to walk, trot, canter, or you learn to jog and lope and actually having them at home and caring for them 24 7 365 those are completely different skill sets and unless you've been taught all of the pieces it's extremely hard amen oh my gosh absolutely i always say that there's riders and then there's horsemen like true that have been in the ditches that have encountered so much that you know and i will tell you two months ago i have my dakota Missouri Fox Trotter, gated horse, um, very stoic as well, came up lame. He had been out playing with his buddies. I saw it and I went, mm, oh, wow. When he did this, this sliding stop and then a pivot on his hind end. And I went, hmm, he's a 21 year old. He's a silly man. But anyways, the next day he came up markedly lame now he you know at other times he could do a little you know took a tiny misstep and 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 he deal like you wouldn't even see it right the fact that he is so stoic and he came up that lame was like this needs to be addressed. So it was the next day that an ultrasound was done. We targeted, it was suspensory desmitis. What are we going to do? We talked about, you know, do we do surgery? Do we wait? And and again, knowing his brain and his, emo you know, wanting to keep him emotionally healthy, I knew he would not stall well because this is a year long of stall rest. So oh. the, the oh. vet and I just sat and I mean, we, he wrote me out the protocol, the rehab protocol, what we were going to do, how we were going to do it on and on and on and on and on. And it's actually three months now, three months later, he is sound, sound, <clears throat> sound. How lucky did we get? But again, you know, you know, your horse, you know, exactly. like this isn't normal for you. Yep this bigger than anything we can deal. This is not a dose of banamine, cold hosing, and we'll be okay. You know, the standing wrap, whatever. It's not, no, it's not. This is bigger and like. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the challenge, right? So I look at, at some of these rescues that have hundreds of, of horses. And I think who could possibly know that level of specificity for hundreds of horses needs. Yeah. You can't, I'm sorry. So unless you have a massive staff and that's part of our plan is that we have in our bylaws, we have a ratio of 10 horses to every one person is our maximum ratio. 
because we need that level of knowledge of their individual needs. And if we ourselves cannot know them to that level, then we have no business trying to manage them. Right. I know the second, so I'll give you another great example, a recent one that's embarrassing, but I owned up to it on our social media. Um, we in took a, an absolutely gorgeous, wonderful, perfect off-track thoroughbred horse um, from friends who are phenomenal equestrians and wonderful people. He was a, my friend's eventing horse. And at some point he stopped feeling comfortable jumping. And they did every single thing for him. He had kissing spine surgery. He had chiropractor, massage therapist, body worker, PAMF blankets, Reiki specialist. I mean, you name it at times 10, he had every single thing available to him. And what we settled on is that we believe it was probably in his head that it would hurt and he can't get past that. So he couldn't be her eventing horse anymore. So they reached out to us to ask if we would be willing to take him. And he is my wonderful riding buddy and we hack around and we have a great time. Um, and the other day we tacked up and we went out for a ride and he, when he's cold backed, so when like, if I don't do all of the right things and keep him in work all the time, he will do this lovely little quasi hip hop buck thing. It's a tiny little buck even though he's a big guy, just to say, oh, I'm feeling good. And that normally lasts maybe a few minutes. In this occasion, it lasted our entire ride. And that was very out of character for him. It was very bizarre. And in my head, I just kept thinking, we've had a lot of time off. He had a couple of eye surgeries recently. And so maybe he's just very fresh. And it never once occurred to me, my very experienced horse life, to look down and I asked my husband to take pictures because I, I'm a matchy, matchy girl. So I love to make outfits that we match. And when we go out for hacks together <laughs> and I looked at this photo and I went, oh my goodness, I am the dumbest person alive. To your point earlier, he was trying to communicate to me and I wasn't listening. My saddle pad for the first time in my entire existence with equestrians had slid halfway back his bum. So it was smacking him in the bum. And then there was no saddle pad in the front by his withers. So he was trying to say, mom, 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 there's mom, something's wrong, something's wrong. And mom didn't listen. <laughs> and bless his heart, he was trying to do what I was asking of him at the exact same time as he was also trying to communicate something isn't right. So even mm -hmm. after the better part of 40 plus years with horses and all that experience, I still didn't listen to the horse who was communicating to me so clearly and so beautifully. And so, you know, we still do dumb stuff, even with all that experience. And it's an example though, of a wonderful horse who was communicating very clearly and a human who just wasn't listening. Sure, sure. And you know, I think they're like we are, they have, you can have five good days in a row and then a day where they're just like, yeah, you know, and you have to respect that. And and I often back in the day when I was doing a lot of showing and coaching and that and would have trainers say to me, I don't know why you keep you always buying fillies and mares and, uh, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, there's something I, I got this. I have this like arrangement with them, like. I'm kind of moody and certain times of the month, I'm not really in the mood for this and that. And I enjoy that relationship with them because they'll tell me like, you know what, mom, today's a really good day for us to just not do anything or let's go take a trail ride. Let's not, we don't have to work on departures or anything. And it's like, you know, just being able to dial that in. And I think that's what helped me as a horseman was having that dialogue with them, was listening to them and honoring it. Oh, okay. But yeah, there are days where you get it wrong. Where you just, I wasn't paying attention. Yep. Oh my goodness. Never turned around to look at the saddle pad. But even our newest, I know him well enough to know that was abnormal behavior. And I still didn't listen. Oh, who would have thought, right? That it slipped back. Who would have thought? Never going to happen again. I can promise that that will never, ever happen again. I'm going to connect every pad to every saddle from now on and no longer skip that. Step. There you go. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for that. Where are we in this? I have my list of questions. For those, meaning 
lay people or anyone actually who are interested in supporting a rescue, your rescue, what do you think people often overlook or misunderstand about the work and the resources that are involved in rehoming, rehabilitating these animals? So very candidly, the biggest challenge is the boring stuff. So people will get very, very worked up and excited and will throw money at medical emergencies. So we have somebody have a medical emergency and they have to go to the hospital or they have to have an immediate surgery or something. People will immediately throw money. Um, if we are going to go to an auction or we, we used to, we don't do this anymore, but we fundraise for a horse that's at a kill pen. Um, people will throw money at that, go get the horse, go save the horse. And then they feel good about that. They contributed to saving the, the, the animal. It shouldn't just say horses because we do much more than horses, but, um, where we struggle. And I, this is a universal for every rescue is the day to day. It's not, nobody gets excited about the purchase of hay or feed or farrier care or, and, you know, biannual shots, right? That's boring. That's not interesting or exciting. I don't feel like I'm doing a, a massive service if I donate to this. So our biggest challenge is how do we create passive income streams that support the day-to-day? -day? Because far and away, those are our biggest expenses. Those are the hardest things to continue to support and manage. So all cards on the table. Um, we here at HodgePodge, we fund 96% of the expenses of the rescue out of our day jobs. So my husband and I both have day jobs. You will learn that most rescues across the country uh, will tell you the same thing, particularly the, the real rescues. Um, we have to have day jobs. Some people have multiple day jobs to support this work that we do because it's not exciting to donate to a hay fundraiser. Nobody gets worked up about that. So how do we continue to try to make excitement happen um, to generate fundraising for those day-to-day -day daily requirements and needs? Because that is absolutely the biggest expense that we have. Um, and we've not cracked that code because we understand that doesn't feel like saving a life. That doesn't feel emotionally jarring, but it really truly is. That's how they survive. That's how they live. And if somebody could ever help us figure out how to motivate people to support the day-to-day, -day, they would win our hearts and minds. I have some ideas. So I'm going to put a pin in that and invite you to join me in a Zoom, another sidebar Zoom meeting, because I do have some ideas for you. Oh, I'd love okay. that. I <laughs> love that. I love to market. Marketing is like my thing. What do you think? What role does education play in HodgePodge's mission? And how do you see community involvement helping to end the slaughter of America's horses? Uh, education is probably a, a, I'm the daughter of an educator, so I'm very passionate about education and nonstop learning. So even with all that experience and all that background, I don't believe for a second that I know one, one millionth of what I need to know to be caring for these creatures. So I am personally constantly taking continuing education, um, free courses about animal care and wherever I can find them. A lot of your veterinary universities offer online Zooms that are frequently just completely free and you can learn about various and sundry topics. So I'm constantly continuing to educate myself and learn. I'm constantly asking our community of followers of HodgePodge for their thoughts and ideas and suggestions, um, especially when we take on new things that we've not really had a lot of experience with. For example, uh, we rescued a new pony a week ago and she has uvitis. And so we are currently researching and digging and, and learning about uvitis and how best to help manage her eyes and her long-term care because we haven't 
So we reach out to our community and say, hey, if anybody has any knowledge, background, skills, experience with the treatment of uvitis, please reach out to us. We'd love to learn. We'd love to hear from you. We have an amazing community of people who have an incredible amount of knowledge um, and are willing to share openly what they know. And so we, we do a lot of that. In turn, we feel very, very strongly that it is our responsibility to teach and educate about these animals. And part of our move to what we call the Forever Farm here in New York is um, we are going to be building a very a large barn with an arena to create a community space. And we want to invite 4-H clubs, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, FFA, schools, youth groups, um, elderly, disabled people, people of every walk of life, to come and experience and learn about these various animals. We are also assembling what we call the outreach team, which are residents that we have that we know are comfortable being on a truck, going to a public event, being adored by humans. And so we take those opportunities to try and get out to fairs and different community events and things to create that proximity. We find that a lot of people have never even had the opportunity to touch a horse. A lot of people don't know what an alpaca is and how that's different from a llama. Um, one of the things we did, and it was a tad controversial, but uh, we had a bottle baby lamb that we raised in our home. Um, and when she was adult sized, it was around Easter time. And so I took um, some face paint paint and I painted on her side to show where wreck of lamb comes from and how people, this is what you're consuming. This is Ivy. She has a name. She is someone. She is a baby. And this is what you are consuming. And we had a number of people who said, I had no idea. They didn't know that that is what they were buying in the grocery store that she had a face and a name and a personality and a community of people who love and adore her. And even if we we just got through to one person, that education saved a life. So we want to create proximity for people to be around these animals, to learn about them, to get to know them, and to start to turn on that compassion that every human we believe has they just lack the education to understand how that relates to these creatures that we we love and adore. And if we can create that proximity, create that education, start to take people on who want to learn about how to care for horses before procuring a horse of their own. Those are courses that we're going to develop and we're going to teach here. It's great that you can sit on a horse, but do you know how to clean a stall? Do you know what amount of water they need every day? Do you know that not all hay is the same and that there's nutrition involved? Um, those are the kinds of things that we want to start sharing and talking about because it's one thing to have the information. It's a completely different world where we start to share it. And we want to share. So that is why I will share that I didn't connect my saddle pad to my saddle when it slid backwards and poor Nighty was trying to tell me. Because even when we make mistakes, we also have a learning experience from them. So we want to share everything we learn, good or bad, and sometimes very, very embarrassing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Can you share with our viewers some of your memorable success stories? Mm -hmm. um, we're incredibly, incredibly fortunate. It, we, we've had a lot of success. Um, I'll, I'll talk about one resident who, who currently is with us and uh, he is a paint pony. His, his name is Cappuccino. He, he was named by one of our most beloved supporters. So uh, if you are a supporter of us at some point in time, you may get naming rights to a new rescue. So that is something that we do. Um, but he, he came from someone who calls themselves a horse trainer and riding instructor who teaches children about riding. He is about 13 two hands. So he's a, a relatively medium sized pony. She was not a small person and she was having trouble catching him. So what she did was she put him in an all nylon halter 
with what they call a drag line. And um, drag line can have purpose if it's done correctly in our experience. In this case, she had taken a three foot lead that was leather and a chain and allowed and clipped it to his halter. And he was walking around, stepping on the lead. And he's a very clever little guy. And he was in a paddock that was made of T posts and wire again, Please don't do that. That is very dangerous, folks. I understand expense, but very dangerous. And this clever little pony um, would scratch on the T-post to try to knock the halter off, and he missed. And he skewered himself in, in his jugular the first time. And we hauled him to the hospital and helped to have that injury repaired, um, and then I'm not happy that I, I let her have him back. Um, she wasn't willing to sign him over to us at that point. She put him back in the nylon halter and the same drag line, and he did it a second time 10 days later. And the second time was mm. much worse, and he nearly died from the injury to his his literal throat. Um, we She sent me texted me a picture of him a very gory picture that I, I don't share. Um, and then the a copy of our, our relinquishment paperwork. And we hauled him to the hospital. He spent 10 days in the hospital in a rig that had to hold his head up in the air because if he put his head down, he would start to bleed. Um, and at the hospital, they really started to adore him. So when we went to pick him up, when he was released, his mane and tail had been braided and he had a little bow and it was absolutely precious and adorable. When we got him back to the rescue and we, we turned him loose, it became very clear that he was not interested in being caught. And that was going to be a significant challenge and he should every single hallmark of a horse that had been beaten in the face. He was what we term, a equestrian's term, head shy. So if you moved your hand, he would panic and run off. So I took that time and decided that the best approach was no approach at all. And so I would give him his feed and sit on a bucket next to him. I didn't make a sound. I didn't move. I would just sit with him. And I then added a bag of cookies that I would open so he could smell them. And eventually, after you know multiple meals a day, every single day for months on end of me just sitting quietly, he started to come over and he was curious about the cookies. And then he would take a cookie from my hand and take off. And then he'd come back because that cookie was really delicious. And we did this over and over every single day for months on end. During that time, we also learned that this, again, horse trainer and riding instructor had been seen feeding her horses in the face with a bucket. So we now know that this is exactly why he doesn't want to be caught. We know exactly why he is afraid of his face being touched. As he and I started to develop that trust and gain that I wasn't going to reach out until he was ready and I wasn't going to try to hurt him, over time it became, I can touch his lips, now I can touch his muzzle, now I can touch his cheek, now I can touch his entire body and his whole head. And we did that through patience, kindness, and allowing him to have the freedom of choice to decide whether or not he wanted to engage or not. To this day, he is still head shy. Um, if you come at him and your hands are, are waving, he's going to take off. But if you come at him calmly and quietly with your hands by your side, he will be right up on you <laughs> looking to see if you have cookies Aww. and things. He is the cutest little thing. He is a very smart, very clever little boy. He just needed time and patience and understanding to help unwind that level of trauma. And now we're starting work so that he can find his own little person and live happily ever after with a kiddo of his own. He loves little people, loves kids. They're his favorite. They make him feel yeah. safe. Big people hurt yeah. him. Little people never did. So we honor and respect that that is what Cappy needs. And we are working through those needs and ultimately hopeful that we will find him his own little person who will love him. Oh, let's hope so. That's beautiful. 
to that, I have to add recently, I was at the equine affair and there was a trainer there, Ryan Rose, who I've watched on YouTube. And I have to say something stood out to me and I really admired him and respect him for it because it's, you know, he looks like your old school cowboy, but he's not. And he had four young ladies in there with their horses and they there were some Cavalettis ground poles on the ground. And one, he said, now approach that on a loose rein, approach the, the ground poles and one horse in particular kind of, and he said, turn away, turn away. And he said, I'll bet you're wondering why I said that he, that horse is worried about that and to make him approach something that he's worried about, he will lose confidence in you. It has to be his choice. And by the time, the fourth time of just on a loose rein and approaching it, eventually that horse put his nose down, sniffed the poles, and it wasn't a problem anymore. But he knew that he had a choice, and so he felt safe. Cappuccino, we love you. <laughs> Kathy has a lot of choices these days, and he doesn't always make good ones. <laughs> that clever little brain is, is a little bit of the pony stereotype that we all have heard about. That's why I love ponies. There's one where Dakota is. He's he's a little Shetland. Like, he's probably barely 11 hands. But I always say, I'm like, oh, Toby, you are a big horse stuck in a little body, and nobody's told you yet. He has the biggest personality and I just love him. Mm. We have a miniature mule who is also a permanent resident. His name is Cotton Candy. He is almost completely white. He is not an albino, which we thought he was when we first rescued him. He's not actually an albino, but he's primarily white unless it's muddy. He, we joke, we saw a meme once that said, God said, take a tornado and shove it into a tiny horse. And the angel says, sir, I think that's a bad idea. And God says, do it. And the end result is cotton candy. He is a tornado in a tiny little body. And he is out here to tell everybody that he is large and in charge and no one can tame him. He oh my gosh. He sounds like he's related to Toby. That's Toby's personality. May I grin from ear to ear when I'm around that pony because he is just oh he's such a man that that guy I love him <laughs> uh, oh here we go how do you balance the physical emotional and training needs of all the animals in your care and do you have a team or specific resources that you rely on on a daily basis weekly whatever what's that team look like uh, our, our team is, is a team of two at the, at the moment. Primarily, it is just my husband and I who do uh, the majority of, of the caretaking and the work around the farm. Um, we foolishly thought that when we got to the forever farm, we would actually have more capacity and more space because we'd have everybody in one place. But uh, silly us, it's actually a lot more work because we've got so much more space and so much more to care for. And so we are very, very busy. Um, I'm not going to lie and say that there's a lot of self-care of humans that happens here. There is not. Um so we, we start our days very early in the morning um, and then and we do our, our morning feedings and we've got a routine for that that we have set up that that's worked really well for us. Um, given my nutrition, equine nutrition background, uh, we have a very specialized set of, of feeds that I am particular about and supplements and we have um, an Excel spreadsheet to <laughs> identify uh, we rely on, I think it's 11 supplements at this point, in addition to some very high quality feeds. And uh, so putting together feed, that's how I cook. That's the only cooking you will ever see this person do is uh, for the animals. And then we are incredibly lucky. We have an incredible neighbor who keeps us stocked up with hay and fills our hay shed and keeps everybody in, in mountains of, of hay and then um, training and and exercise and all of those kinds of things are, are predominantly me. But uh, 
in our, our current facility, we were very fortunate that we have a great community that has come and enveloped us in the past four months since we got here. And so we have folks who are helping us with mowing and we have folks that are helping us with maintaining the land and managing some of the things. And then we have an unbelievable number of people who parade through here on a daily basis that bring carrots and apples and treats of all kinds. And so I'm constantly getting photos of just how spoiled, rotten all of the creatures <laughs> are because because this community has just embraced us so beautifully. Um, but we rely on, um, you know, my knowledge background and, and education and whatever, you know, tips and tricks I can, I can come up with. So one of the things that I did for the move and that we've actually now carried forward is every um, animal has a color assigned to them. So their halter is that color, their feed bucket is that color, their paperwork when they were being transported was color coded so that they could determine, for example, Windsor. Windsor's color is is orange. So he has an orange halter. He has an orange bucket. His paperwork had orange highlighters so that they would know this is when his coggins was taken. This is who he is. Because when you're transporting 20 animals on professional transporters, it can get a little scary to make sure everybody knows what everything is. And we've now carried that forward because it makes it easier for our followers to know who each animal is, because some of them tend to look alike. A, a bay gelding looks differently to me who has an experience with horses than it does to the general public. They look at, at our three bay horses and go, I, I, I don't know how to tell the difference. So Knight has a black halter and Helios has a green halter and Xandro has a hot pink halter. So they know and can make distinguishments between who their, their favorites are. It also helps in terms of keeping things organized and knowing who needs what and when. And, and, and of course, the spreadsheet is color coded too. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Oh, I would love to do your typology. We might have to do that too. You sound like a high J. I don't know. I'm an, a certified equine gestalt practitioner. So I'm certified in working with horses as coaches. They co-coach in healing trauma oh. in individuals. So a typology is some one of the oh. first tests that I give people so that I know how to interact with them based on their innate typology. Right. Oh, how you, fascinating. You do sound like a high J because you're resonating <laughs> with me and I'm a high J as well. And I love Excel. That is like, just put it in a spreadsheet. Just put it, just put it all in a spreadsheet. Everybody's like, I, I don't do Excel. <gasps> what? How? How do you not? I don't know how to live without it. <laughs> same, same. Oh my gosh. Even my grocery list is in one. Like it really is totally resonate with the supplements. I will break down what added supplements and minerals are in a grain I'm feeding. And then I could make sure that I've got the same, you know, milligrams and the, this and mill so that I know I'm not overdoing it. I can probably yeah. do away with that because it's already covered in. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. But a lot of time is spent on that. Absolutely. It's kind of fun. You and I, we just get a little rush. I think out of out of data. <laughs> <laughs> that is oh. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so, looking at your future, what are your goals for Hodge Park Hodge? I'm got um, a little tongue tied. What are your goals for Hodgepodge? So my goal for Hodgepodge truly is for Hodgepodge to not be needed. In a perfect world, I wish that uh, what we do did not need to be in existence and that I could frankly go back to just being a, a, a regular private citizen who has some animals that I love and adore and spoil rotten. But I don't know that that will happen in my lifetime. So our, our goal is is primarily, um, so our, our, our simplistic sort of footprint is uh, rescue, rehabilitate, rehome. Now, obviously we are, we do have a permanent sanctuary function. And so there are a volume of, of animals that will call hodgepodge their permanent home forever. So their rehome is to become a permanent sanctuary resident. Um, and we make those decisions individually based upon medical, mental, emotional needs. So we, we factor in all of the things that that animal has going on and make those decisions individually. And then sometimes we're able to adjust those decisions down the road. Um, a good example of that was Iceman was always intended to be adopted out. We actually had a long list of people who were in 
absolute love with him. And then as we started to uncover his medical issues that have been very, very extensive, we found that unfortunately we could not comfortably rehome him safely and know that he would receive the level of care that is required to keep him healthy. So we had to convert him to a permanent sanctuary resident. Um, but in a perfect world, really what we want to do is we want to educate, 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 and we want to create proximity. There are so many people in this world who have never touched a pig and have no idea what a pig feels like. And so if you have that cognitive dissonance of, I don't know what a pig feels like, I don't know anything about a real life pig, but I go to the store and purchase pork products, Perhaps if we can start to create the connection of people to these animals that they've never had any proximity to, we can start to change hearts and minds about how we consume food, how we treat creatures that become food for us, things that people don't otherwise have the ability to know or understand. We also want to be able to educate particularly horse owners so that they can do better that they can raise their animals, treat their animals, manage their animals more effectively, more efficiently so that they can keep them. Because the goal is not for us to take every horse, every alpaca, every pig, every goat, every sheep. We can't. We will never have the resources to be able to do that. So what we do have the resources to do endlessly is to educate and share what we know. And even the things that we do wrong, we share and educate about those too, because it's important for lifelong learning. So our goal really is to continue to push the narrative out into the world of how to be better stewards of our animal friends and how to create a world where we are no longer needed. Indeed. Indeed. Hmm. Last question, Lauren. I know I'm sure you've got a lot on your list of things to do. And I thank you for taking this time from what I am certain is a very busy day as every day <laughs> is for you and sharing Usually. this with us. It's so valuable. And again, I really would like to do a Zoom with you and we can go over some ideas for um, creating funding to help with this because honestly, 20 plus animals that you are giving so much love and quality of life to out of yours and your husband's own, you know, revenue that you, it's a lot. I know it's a lot. I know, I know, I know. So we, we're going to get clever. And again, to our viewers, purchase that book on Amazon, The Happy Horse Keeper. It's a great manual of all the important things one should know if you're contemplating bringing a horse home to your property or even purchasing a horse and boarding. There's a lot of good knowledge in there. And by doing so, after we pay for our publishing costs, all profits, every penny will go to HodgePodge Rescue. This is a, a very dear to me uh, movement. I'll call it a movement. Um, and I live a simple life, but I'm grateful for the life I have. Um, I require so little and like you, um, everything goes into the best care that I can possibly give to the, to the, the, the beautiful creatures that I share a life with. So my hat is off to you for the work that you're doing and to your husband for being such a, powerhouse of I mean this isn't easy like you know uh, uh, he's sharing so <laughs> much resources and you and time and energy and all of that that is a huge undertaking and I am grateful for all that you are doing so I am going to help in any way that I can and I ask our viewers to do so as well there is a link for that book as well as all the information to contact Lauren from HodgePodge Rescues um, and, and reach out to her and ask, how can I help? What can I do? And we'll keep everyone abreast of what all the fun things we're coming up with to make this even better and bigger and have more impact. And for anyone interested in starting their own rescue, 
what advice would you give about the realities of animal rescue and what it truly takes to make a difference? Because you pointed out from the beginning and you are so spot on that there are those false rescues. How, you know, how do we identify those? And give us your take on that, your advice, whatever you've got in closing to share with us. We want to hear it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll never, ever be enough. Our gratitude runneth over truly. Um, what I would say to anyone who is considering starting and getting involved in this work is I would strongly recommend you find a rescue near you and you go in and volunteer and support that rescue. Get your hands dirty get involved and see what it really truly is like, because what you see online is not what it's like. Predominantly, we spend a lot of our time um, shoveling and digging and stacking and building and maintaining. And um, it is a very, very physically active life. You, you can't unfortunately phone it in from bed. It doesn't work that way. Uh, this is a 24-7, 365 activity. There are no vacations from this. The work never stops. You don't ever get to skip a day. They need to be fed and cared for and adored every minute of every single day. So those of us who are already doing this work are absolutely at our our, our greatest gratitude for anyone who comes in and is willing to pick up a shovel or stack some hay or feed six pounds of carrots and three pounds of apples to your animals when you are laid up with a cold. Um, this work is very, very, very tiresome and tedious. And I will also admit, you know, when we filed for our nonprofit status and we became an official 501c3, I very silly me thought, now people are just going to donate because we're a real charity and the money's just going to come flooding in and then we're going to be able to spend this whole thing and it's going to be amazing. That is not the case. That is not the case at all. Um, you will be shocked and disappointed by the people you know that you think will be pouring money into you. They will not. Um, people don't just throw money at something because it's a 501c3. The other thing that's important to that point also is that just because someone has their 501c3 nonprofit charity status does not make them a real true blue quality rescue. It is pretty easy to file paperwork and get a piece of paper that says you are such and such. It is a lot harder to then put in the work to actually show that. So one of the things when, when I talk about, you know, how to know the, the real from the fake, um, important point number one, if they are constantly every single day or every single week fundraising to purchase more animals, that should be a red flag to you. No one is capable of taking in and appropriately caring for new rescues at a pace of 50, 100, 200, 300 a month. It's not a sustainable or practical business model. The appropriate way of doing an intake is to quarantine an animal for a minimum of 30 days. And they have to be quarantined at a minimum of 30 feet from any other animal on property. You cannot do that with 200, 300 horses a month. It's not plausible which means they're either sharing diseases and continuing to circulate things, or they're not actually being saved. So the other thing that's equally important is, are you seeing follow-ups for that specific horse or animal that you helped to save? Are you seeing day two, day seven, day 30, day 60? Because it is unbelievably rare I mean, we're talking less than 0.1% of the time that an animal is rescued from an auction, quarantined appropriately, and offered and able to be rehomed in anything less than two months. So if you aren't seeing consistent updates about that particular animal that you donated to, that should be a red flag to you. 
we post and share about every single animal that comes to this property at least once a week. I try to make it a point to make sure I get an update or some a picture, a video, a something about every single creature that lives and calls HodgePodge home so that our supporters know they are here, they are loved, they are cared for, they are fed. If you don't see that, you should be alarmed. Additionally, if you see a rescue that their solution is very frequently euthanasia. So they go to an auction, they bring it home and say, oh no, it's got to be put down. That should be a red flag to you. Do we put animals down at HodgePodge? Unfortunately, yes, it is part of the program that we have and things that we have to do. They get to a point where they are extremely elderly or they have a health crisis, but we will go to the ends of the earth to manage through any health crisis leading up to doing anything and everything we can, whether it is Eastern medicine, Western medicine, um, We've even tried some some things that people probably think are crazy, like animal communicators and, and Reiki and various things. Euthanasia should be where there is no other possible option available to that animal. It should not be based in a decision that is financial. If you are buying horses to put them down to raise money, you mm -hmm. are a horrible human. You are not a rescuer and you do not deserve that mantra. Euthanasia should be extraordinarily rare. Uh, well, that brings to mind one down south that I do follow because I am just curious every week as to what's going on. And they're rescuing 50 plus horses every couple of weeks. And yet when someone walks around with the camera on the property, I'm not seeing these horses and I'm not seeing these, you know, they used to have adoption day and, you know, 20 people would show up to adopt a horse and that's not happening. And, you know, and, and a, a, a tremendous amount of euthanasia so much so that they bought their own cremation, uh, apparatus to to cremate right there yes um and yet they're fundraising as they're picking up as they're doing a a, a a a you know buyout they're doing buyouts now i think they've been banned from different auction sites and the the, the property the the buildings and the you know, education center and the intake barn and all that. It just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And I'm like, but where are these horses going? It doesn't make where any sense. Where are the horses? And, and even where things as simple as, and I look at these things, I'll say, okay, I saw that horse come in for intake three months ago. And now you're just bringing him in to start assessing this we'll call it a gelding right and but then i'm looking at that horse's feet and i'm like nobody trimmed that horse's feet and you've had them for three months and i was seeing those things over and over and over and so the pieces for me and probably someone like you most likely you they don't make any sense. It doesn't, none of it fits together properly. And they are doing that kind of fundraising where they're constantly doing things on social media and raising money, raising money. But then I'm seeing, you know, half those horses that came through intake, you euthanized, you gave them the last act of kindness because you saved them from the slaughter pipeline. But you're saying if they've got them, they weren't, they weren't there to begin with. Correct. It is very, very disturbingly and sadly a, a money grab. It's a cash grab. Like yeah. I referenced earlier, people get super motivated and excited to throw money at saving the horse from the truck. And they get super excited if you've got a massive medical emergency. Outside of that, it's nearly impossible to fundraise. So how are these people doing it? They're showing you the sickest, saddest, worst looking animal. You're throwing money to save said animal. And then they're, so let's say, so it, it, let me scale back a little bit. Um, 
demand for American horse meat has come down by a significant margin because, as I referenced earlier, all of the vaccinations, medications, supplements, et cetera. So um, the EU has now banned the import of American mm. horse meat for the purposes of consumption by humans, which is a tremendous win for the horse world. Um, but there are still lots of organizations that do not have any caps on breeding and who do not penalize anyone for their horses ending up in the slaughter pipeline. So if we're still producing the same number of horses, but we're not shipping that same number to slaughter, where are all the horses? There's a rescue, rescue, um, that is a very, very large uh, entity on social media exclusively. They fundraise and purchase uh, hundreds on a monthly basis. They contend that they adopt out hundreds on a monthly basis. There are not hundreds of people interested in adopting rescue horses. Full stop. It is incredibly hard to place a rescue horse. Most equestrians are of the belief that a rescue horse is old, broken, sickly, or otherwise not going to be able to do what they want to do. So if we have a struggle to find adopters on a onesie twosie basis, how is an entity like that coming up with hundreds each month? They are not. Sure not. What they are doing, and it is absolutely sickening, is they are purchasing horses and either one, they're taking them to a place where they are euthanizing them as you referenced, or two, they're taking the money and turning around and handing that horse right back to the slaughter guy to put on the truck and have it disappear. And then it's that, accidentally yeah. shipped. Yeah. I, Just I, like I, Huckleberry, who sits in my backyard, was accidentally shipped to slaughter. Yeah. The horses are disappearing. And until we as a community start demanding accountability for each specific animal, it's never going to stop. And unfortunately, those are the people that are getting the money to do the work that we would really like to be doing the right way, but we're not getting it because I didn't put out a post last Sunday that says, I'm going to the auction and I'm going to buy the sickest, scariest, saddest one with tears and my makeup running down my face. I hooked up our truck and trailer. I drove to a, a lovely farm where it's a riding stable and they recognized that this sweet little girl was starting to lose her vision and was having a hard time with continuing to be a lesson pony and that she needed to go somewhere where her needs would be cared for and she would be cared for for the rest of her life. That's not fun. That's not emotionally stirring. It's not sexy. It doesn't get people motivated off their couches. But Sweet Pea is here without going through the trauma, being passed around from auction to auction, becoming sickly from diseases that are spread at auctions, becoming rail thin because she wasn't being fed. Instead, she comes here and she gets a brand new blanket and a brand new best friend. And we adore her and tell her she's beautiful and that we love her. And nobody throws a hundred thousand dollars at us for it. But I know that I sleep really well at night because sweet pea will never have to go through that experience. And we will keep her and treasure her and honor her for all of her days. And if everyone did that, none of us would be needed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a beautiful note to end on. And my brain is going now. I'm like, okay, next book demystifying <laughs> rescues. Oh, I would be thrilled to help you with that. I have unfortunately learned a lot of very disgusting things about. Let's do it. How about we get your thoughts into word, right? I'll take it to the, to the next level. And that's in detailing and formatting and getting it ready for publishing. If, if that you would be amazing. I'd love to do that. I would de Education. I desperately, desperately want, and I really, you know, we try, there are, are a group of, of rescues that we try really hard to share this message and get it out there. And people just don't want to hear it. They love that emotional rush they get from throwing a hundred bucks at this horse that they will never 
see again. And I wish that we could get them to have that same emotional rush, seeing that horse grazing in a field loved and cared for and adored. So if we can rewire mm-hmm. humans to get your dopamine from seeing happy, healthy animals instead of struggling, scary stuff, we'd all be winning. Yeah. Yeah. I see I see in the future like a pamphlet that has all these bullet points of the truth, the myth, and the goal. For real well, rescues. All right. Well, we'll we're going to do that, Lauren. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, you, thank you so much, not only for being here and sharing your wisdom and your hands-on knowledge with myself and our viewers, but for the work that you do. Those who, if I come back in this life and I need I need a, a, a rescue home, I'm going to, I'll be finding you. We would love to have you. We would love to have you come and visit, even not as a rescue that needs somewhere to go. Um, We are, we are thrilled and honored. And we're always so grateful when anybody wants to come and just experience what hodgepodge is and hear the stories and visit with the kids and, and give them treats and tell them how wonderful they are, because that's all they ever have to do is just be adored. Oh, and on that beautiful note, my friend, my new friend, Thank you. And I look forward to catching up with you very, very soon. Me as well. I'm excited about all of these things. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Be well. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thank you.